Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you um, to the third annual five-minute undergraduate research oral competition, the five-minute fast track. Um, if you would, please ensure that all your phone devices are turned on mute, just as a reminder. Thank you. My name is Evie Russell, and I'm the Assistant Director for the Undergraduate Research Program here at the University of Kentucky. This is Jesse Bowman, my colleague, and we are thrilled to be hosting this competition here this evening. Um, we look forward to hearing from our top 10 finalists, and this presentation is being recorded um, live through YouTube um, and through Facebook Live. I want to encourage questions for our virtual audience and judges. Feel free to ask questions. You each have a mic, um, so you will be asking your questions verbally. The um, virtual audience, please use your comments on your um, device. So congratulations, students, for making it to the final round. This evening, we are excited to hear you, hear you present your trailblazing research through concise and effective storytelling. Originally, the five-minute fast track was modeled after the graduate school's three-minute thesis competition. We designed this competition um, to prepare and develop students' communication skills when discussing their research to diverse audiences. Student researchers are not automatically trained to communicate their work in layman terms. Oral presentations are one of the best platforms where nonverbal cues combined with effective verbal skills add a broader aspect to a student's communications toolbox. So at this time, I would like to introduce our judges. First, Provost David Blackwell. Next, Dr. Anna Bosch, Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs in the College of Arts and Sciences. And lastly, Dean Christian Brady, Honors College and Interim Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Thank you very much for being with us this evening. At this time, I'm going to just quickly review the rules of the competition. So when you see your name appear on the screen, please make your way down to be fitted for the mic. I will clean each mic after use. <coughs> um, you can choose to use a pointer as well. You will have five minutes to present your research. At the one minute mark, a green cue card will be held up. At the 30-second mark, a yellow card will be held up. After closure, I'm sorry, you must be finished speaking at the ring of the bell. Okay. And after the closure of the Q&A of that presenter, we will, have, we will pause for a few minutes to give the judges time to write down any comments or um, notes that they might want to take. Once all the pres presenter presentations are complete, we will ask the students to exit the cinema so that the judges can deliberate. Once the results are, are finalized, we will reconvene back in here in the students uh, in the Worsham Theater, the Worsham Cinema, and we will proceed with the uh, presentation of the uh, the award ceremony. Do any of you have any questions before we get started? Judges, do you have any questions? Okay. All right. Well, without further ado, let's get started.
Science and Biology. I'm from Dr. Matthew Gentry's lab in the Molecular and Cellular Biochemistry Department, and I'm excited to present my research piece today, Personalized Medicine for Fatal Epilepsy Before and Treat. Before disease is a devastating genetic form of epilepsy that manifests during childhood. These children experience increasingly severe seizures while also suffering from symptoms of cognitive decline and difficulty controlling their muscles. Typically, they will die in their early 20s. So what drives before disease? If you could direct your attention to the bottom left image, you'll see a brain tissue slide with an arrow pointing to a dark future circle. This is a Lephora body, which is an aggregation of sugar that kills neurons and therefore drives disease progression. And while all patients with Lephora disease exhibit similar symptoms, the age of onset and the rate of progression varies significantly from patient to patient. And because of this variability, Lephora disease patients are good candidates for personalized medicine. So today, I will walk you through my project of how I characterize mutations within Lephora disease in order to aid the development of creating personalized therapy. So first, I will introduce you to the protein Leforin. Then, I will walk you through a pipeline developed in order to characterize Leforin mutants. And finally, I will share my results. Leforin is a protein that has the critical function of regulating how our brains store sugar, especially, yeah, especially in the brain. As you can see, Leforin is, create, is made up of two domains. And the patients with Lefora disease often exhibit DNA mutations that lead to the production of Lefora mutants. But to understand how that could lead to Lefora disease, let me discuss two key functions within Lefora concerning its domains. The blue domain binds to uh, sugar, while the domain in purple is responsible for removing phosphate from sugar. If there's an impairment in either of these functions, Lefora bodies form, and this makes sense because we know that Leforin is responsible for regulating sugar storage, and if that's impaired, Lefora bodies would form. Our lab has developed a pipeline with a series of tests in order to characterize these mutations. So we can take novel mutations, run them through the pipeline, and then based on the characterizations we draw, we can classify them into groups in terms of their severity, such as group A, B, and C, as demonstrated by the top right image showing the spectrum of Lefora disease severity in terms of the groups. But what does this pipeline look like? I will demonstrate to you what it actually looks like by walking you through how I used it to characterize three recently identified patient mutations. G24R, which occurs in the domain in blue, A268T, which occurs near the active site of the domain in purple, and V249L, which occurs in another part of the domain in purple. So the first step of the pipeline is to test for the functioning of the domain in blue. And if you'll remember, that's the ability to bind to sugar. And this is measured in percent sugar binding ability. So the greater interactions and ability the protein has to bind to sugar, the higher the percent sugar binding ability. And as you can see, when we compare this to the wild type, uh, the G24R mutation has a significantly reduced ability to bind to sugar. And therefore, we can characterize this mutation as having an impairment in the functioning of the domain in blue. The next step of the pipeline is to test for the functioning of the domain in purple. And if you'll recall, that's the ability to remove phosphate. So therefore, we measure this in phosphate release. And when we compare it to the wild type, once again, you can see a mutant is having a significantly worse time uh, in performing near wild type levels. And this is A268T. So therefore, we can characterize this mutant as having an impairment in the functioning of the domain in purple. And when we look back at the data in terms of how the Leforin domains are performing when we compare it to the functioning of the wild type, V249L seems to be doing a good job. However, the last step of the pipeline is to look at the overall stability of the protein, and we measure this in melting temperature. And as you can see, the V249L mutation has a significantly reduced melting temperature when compared to that of the wild type, which is actually close to our body temperature. And that has severe implications for how it would function in our bodies. So as you can see, these three mutations had three vastly different impacts on Leforin's functioning. And that can be used to explain that variability that we see in the age of onset and the rate of progression. And as we discuss these mutations, we can't forget that these are three individuals that are suffering uniquely from a disease without a cure. However, with continued characterization and research, we can build the foundation for developing personalized therapies 
that can improve the quality of life for these individuals and their families. Thank you for your time, and I will now be taking questions. I have a question. Uh, can, can you explain what a wild type is? Okay, so the wild type is the, oh, you're fine. Wild type is the unmutated um, form of the protein. So meaning as it appears in the wild, so, so to speak? Yes, that's I got what it's it. supposed to look like. Okay, yeah, a term of art I haven't heard. Um, and are there any known therapies to, to treat this disease? So currently um, what physicians are doing is they're just addressing these symptoms and treating them and they'll change the diet of the patient to like a keto diet um, in ways to kind of reduce the severity of it. but. Currently, no, but excitingly, the parts of the Gentry Lab are currently working on therapies for this disease, with the first, one of them going to trial in 2021. So I've got a couple of questions, mostly just my ignorance, but the first is <coughs> on these charts, the, uh, <coughs> the bottom axis, WT, I'm assuming, stands for wild type. Yes. Do the others, which I recognize uh, correspond with the above and the three individuals, but they are not correlated with groups A, B, and C at the top right. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, now this is this is the the ignorant question. Um, I I know what phosphate is. I think I know what makes up sugar, but I'm not sure I do. And th you say here's a slide of a brain, and that's sugar. I mean, I love sweet tarts, but I'm guessing it's not <laughs> quite the same circumstance. So what is sugar here? Yeah, chemically and, and what's going on? So the sugar that we're looking at in Lafora bodies, it's actually an aggregation of glycogen, which is made up of glucose. Um, uh, so that's what we're looking at in, the, uh, in that image, that's what you're seeing. And the phosphate that we talk about, the reason that's important is because if we're not able to remove the phosphate from the sugars, then we can't break it down and get rid of it. And so it aggregates and it builds up and it affects the functioning of humanity. So can I ask one more question? Yes. So your title is Personalized Medicine for Fatal Epilepsy. You said at the very end that this research is helping us to potentially do that, but what is it? What would the personalized medicine be? Take us beyond just this slide. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, the Gentry Labs is currently collaborating with two companies to create two independent uh, personalized treatments. So this can be applied to that in that once we characterize each mutation, uh, we can classify them into different groups based on their severity. And so clinicians in the drug trial, they can use this and they can um, identify which patients would be the most um, optimal to receive the treatment. So in this instance, it would be group C because the Leforin that is less severe, those patients that have mutations that are less severe in Leforin would be better candidates and more likely to respond to the treatment. And then furthermore, when addressing like groups A and B, uh, when, when physicians have this information and know just how serious their patient's disease is and what kind of uh, prognosis they can uh, expect, they can then uh, alter their treatment plan to like increase dosage and just be more aggressive overall. Thank you very much. Thank this you. has been really um, a fascinating talk, and even though I'm not a scientist, I, I'm pretty sure I followed what you were trying to explain to us. My question is, um, what kind of uh, human tissue sample are you working with for this kind of research? Is it a, is it a, you know, are you working from blood samples? Are you working from, who knows what? Can you explain to me what 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 goes into doing this research? Yes, so I'm actually, parts of our lab are concerned with addressing the tissues, but I just grow the protein itself in the lab and experiment on it then. But like that brain tissue slide, that's the brain tissue slide that you're seeing over there. Um, but that's basically where we're seeing Lafora bodies mostly, and that those uh, aggregation of Lafora bodies in the neurons is the most critical. So if you were to look for tissues to study, I would.
Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Hi everybody, I'm Hallie Shannon. I'm a junior here at UK studying chemical engineering and I did my research with Dr. Escobar in the UK Center of Membrane Sciences. So a big problem faced in the world today is water scarcity. This is a really big issue because a lot of people don't have access to clean water. And a potential solution to this problem is using polymeric membranes for water filtration. So as you can see here on the slide, um, these membranes are used in a sequence and the pore size of the membrane selectively rejects solutes that are inside the water. So as we go from microfiltration to ultrafiltration to nanofiltration to reverse osmosis membranes, those pore sizes in the membranes decrease and more and more solutes are able to be rejected with the reverse osmosis membranes rejecting even ions. So a big problem that happens using these membranes though is biofouling and this happens whenever bacteria grows on the surface of the membrane. This is bad because one, it decreases the efficiency of the membranes with bacteria plugging the pores that selectively reject the solutes in the water as well as potentially risking the quality of the water coming out of these membranes with bacteria being in the, the resulting water. So a potential solution to avoid biofouling that we were studying in this study was to attach uh, silver nanoparticles to our membranes. So this has been done previously with a physical attachment to the surface of the membranes. 
but this was a weak attachment. So what we were looking to do is chemically attach these silver nanoparticles in one stage and have a stronger attachment of those inside the membranes. So looking at our results, we used X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy to determine if there was any silver inside our membranes. What we were looking at is this is a comparison of our original cellulose acetate membranes to our one weight percent silver nanoparticle and our two weight percent silver nanoparticle membranes, both before and after our leaching studies to see if we had a peak at this AG3D point. And this showed us that at every stage we had a peak here, which showed that we successfully had silver attached to our membranes. And so knowing that we had that attachment, we wanted to do some leaching studies to see if the silver was leaching from our membranes. So the initial study that we did was a cross-flow leaching study. This was a cumulative study. So what we did is we filtered water through the membranes for seven days at a time. And at the end of every day, we would take a sample and determine how much silver was leached from that day. And so these are cumulative values. And what we saw is that the majority for both the one weight percent and the two weight percent silver nanoparticle membranes, the majority of the silver that was leached happened in the first day of testing and then they were fairly stable. And what this told us is that after an initial leaching period, we would be able to use these membranes without any silver really coming off and polluting the, further, the water further. And actually after doing some um, calculations to see how much silver was retained on the membranes, we determined that up to 97% of silver was retained within our membranes. So knowing this, we decided to go to a dead end leaching study where we filtered batches of water through each membrane 100 milliliters at a time. And so from here, these are the data from each 100 milliliters. And what we saw is that with both membranes, there was a trend of a slight increase of leaching followed by a decrease of leaching after a few hundred milliliters. And this is a trend that we expected to see after filtering um, water through on our cross-flow leaching study. So this showed that after a period of time, the leaching was reduced from the membranes and the silver was retained throughout. So knowing that we had a successful attachment and that we weren't leaching silver from our membranes significantly, we decided to do our antimicrobial performance testing. And so for this, we use the bacteria Serratia marcescens. We use this because it grows with a pink tint. So we're able to determine its presence by color technology. So that's what this is. Um, it's our red, green, blue, and color difference. And you can see red, green, and blue on the different axes of this chart. And so what we did here is we used a negative control plate with zero bacteria on the plate and a positive control plate that was covered in bacteria. And we analyzed those as compared to our original cellulose acetate membranes, our one weight percent silver membranes, and our two weight percent silver nanoparticle membranes. And what we saw is that the original cellulose acetate membranes themselves reduced the bacterial growth a little bit on the, on the membrane. But as we added our, membrane, our silver to our membranes, the one weight percent removed more, sil or more bacteria from the plate. And then with our two weight percent silver nanoparticle membranes, we were able to see up to a 99 reduction in growth of bacteria on these membranes. So this was very promising results showing us that our membranes were um, able to prevent this bacterial growth as well. So our conclusions from the study was that we had a successful attachment of these silver nanoparticles. We attached them in a way that reduced leaching and the, the silver nanoparticles were also able to prevent bacteria from growing on the membranes. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. I have a couple of questions. Okay. So why, why, would, um, why would you not expect the uh, silver nanoparticles to attach to the membrane? I mean, what, what would explain that not attaching? So um, if I understand your question right, tell me if I don't answer your question. Um, so in previous studies, the chemical attachment to the membranes of the silver nanoparticles was just a surface reaction. So it was something that was more weak. It wasn't inherent in the polymer itself of our membranes. But what we did for this study is we actually attached the silver nanoparticles to the polymer before creating the, the membrane itself. So I didn't go into much detail in our casting here, but what you do to make the membrane is you have a solvent and you have a polymer complex inside of that solvent. And you mix those together and then put, put that against a blade and um, you immerse it into water and it forms those pores. So by it being in the initial polymer itself, it's more chemically attached in that membrane itself instead of just being on the surface of that membrane. So you're, you're really just testing this innovation against the prior uh, best practice in a way. Yes. And then uh, how, uh, I don't understand the chemistry or of why 
or how uh, silver would inhibit bacterial growth. Can you explain that? Yeah, so um, there is a thiol group in our polymer complex, or there's a thiol group, sorry, in the bacteria that was um, going to grow on our membranes that the silver nanoparticle group in the, our membranes actually attracts. And so it interacts with the thiol group inside the bacterial um, cells themselves and deactivates them, and that prevents them from being able to grow on the membranes. We go. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm sorry. What, did you want to go? Oh, I, forgive me. I didn't turn. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, massive difference uh, between one one percent and two percent. Uh, actually, first, I didn't quite understand. Uh, were you saying one weight? W e i g h t percent. Yes. Okay. What is the? There's a huge difference here on the normalized so 41 to to, to one. What is the magnitude of difference between 1% and 2%? That doesn't look like it's much, but I mean, what, what's going on there that makes such a dramatic difference? And would it make a dramatic difference in terms of, of cost-benefit analysis of, of going to the 2% versus the 1? Okay, thank you. That's a very good question. So um, one weight percent versus two weight percent, it seems like it's a small difference, but it's actually twice the amount of silver that's going to be in that membrane itself. So there's a lot more silver available to be reacting with that bacteria on the membrane. Um, and as far as the cost analysis, um, we haven't done as further, as far of a look into that for wide scale application and for scale up studies, but we are in um, talks with another university and doing large scale studies to see how that would weigh out um, in a larger scale setting. Nice pun. Um, <laughs> and in my last question, in terms of the leaching, at what's the point at which um, the amount of silver leached into the resultant water is, is a health risk? So the EPA's limit on water into drink, or of silver into drinking water is 100 parts per billion. So even with our, these are all in parts per billion up here too. So uh, okay. um, what we were seeing here is that with our maximum amount of silver that was leached from our membranes, it was just at that EPA limit. So if we did an initial leaching of silver from those membranes with an initial wash through of water, say for a day, um, and then we removed that water and then started filtering new water through there, the resulting water from that point on should not have anything that goes over that limit. Very good, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, my colleagues already asked a couple of wonderful questions, and so um, now I'm grasping at straws trying to think of what I can ask next. <laughs> um, uh, are, these, are these membranes that you're talking about um, for filtration uh, going to be pretty much comparable to existing membranes? Could you take a piece of equipment that uses current, the current technology and replace it with your own membranes and pretty much um, avoid having to create an entirely new piece of equipment uh, yes. while, while adding this more advanced uh, membrane for filtration? Yes, ma'am, that's a good question as well. So these, uh, so for one, cellulose acetate, we chose this because it's a very common polymer that's used in these types of membranes, so we wanted it to be something that's fairly cheap and something that's replicable in larger scale settings like that. And so membrane technologies are actually something that are used in the field today. Um, so there are machines that are readily available to make these types of membranes for this application. Um, the only difference is that the polymer that they were going to be using in those applications are a little bit different with our chemical reaction being done beforehand. Excuse me. Then to implement them in the field, so to speak, to make use of them in a, in a, in a city or in a rural area or something like that, um, you should be able to use the same kind of membrane in the equipment that they use for their water filtration already. Yes, ma'am. So yeah. the qualities of the membranes themselves aren't actually that different than the membranes that are created today with just cellulose acetate. So um, they have around the same pore size, they're around the same depth, they have most of the same qualities. The only difference is that polymer that's going into it. So um, they should be able to fit into the technology that's already out there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody.
Does this sound okay? Y'all can hear me? Awesome. excited to be presenting my research to you today. Uh, I do qualitative research on cultural competency and humility and I uh, want to take this time to thank my mentor if she's watching uh, and she is Dr. Randa Reamer Eskridge. So, um, it was eye-opening and helped me see that there were so many distinctive and unique people in the world. Hello everyone, and I am super excited to present my research to you today, uh, my qualitative research on distinctive and unique people, healthcare students' discomfort in defining diversity. So there are many gaps in research on diversity-related topics. Many of these only have one time point worth of data, and there are, there's a lot of research lacking in the field of healthcare. So our research sought to fill these gaps. We have three different time points of data. And we also studied, uh, we did research on diversity related course on pre-healthcare students. So this course, this diversity related course, uh, consisted of 30 undergraduate white and primarily female students who were all pre-healthcare. So this course also consi uh, consisted of the lecture, the lab, and uh, a service learning component as well. So this lab is primarily what we're going to be focusing on as well as some different assignments that we analyzed to get our data here today. The lab was a safe space for students to talk about diversity related topics, which is consistent with transformative learning principles. So in this course, our research consisted of three time points worth of data, as you can see here. Time one was before the class meeting, time two was at the midterm of the course, and time three was at the final assignment of the course. And so by looking over these responses, we were able to look for similar ways that these diversity related topics were discussed. Then we sorted these quotes from the assignments into similar groups, and then we refined those and named them according to what we saw in the data. So these are what are called our themes. So as you can see, underneath each time point, we have our themes. So throughout this whole sorting process, um, we also thought about our different backgrounds and how our backgrounds might affect the way that we sort our data. And some of these backgrounds uh, include three of four of the team members um, identified as being white, and we all value diversity. So we made sure to memo this, write it down, and talk to our different team members to make sure that this didn't affect our research. So our research um, consisted of three sets of data, and we named each of these based on how the students were processing their discomfort. Time one, students were experiencing discomfort. Time two, students were reacting to discomfort. And time three, students reflected on their discomfort. Then we broke these down even further into three 
subcomponents, which we call sub-themes in qualitative research. So in time one, students were experiencing discomfort, and this was seen through using language that was not their own. So for example, students relied on socialized language or using phrases such as distinctive and unique people instead of using privilege and race. They avoided using those two terms, um, and it's possible that these might be because they were unfamiliar to discussing diversity or were afraid of failing to de define diversity themselves. And then they also excluded whiteness from diversity. So this primarily white class might have seen themselves as the norm. Next, they reacted to their discomfort. So they acknowledged that they were uncomfortable speaking about diversity to their peers for fear of being seen as unpopular or uneducated. Then they were also naming their discomfort and said, I am uncomfortable with um, talking about diversity because maybe I haven't done this before, but also because I'm uncomfortable with my um, participation in systems of oppression. And then lastly, um, students excuse themselves from continued discomfort um, because they were uncomfortable with um, their participation in systems of oppression, but also because they wanted to discontinue that. So last time, uh, they reflected their discomfort. Um, some students called the course a hoax, which means rejecting discomfort. Some students allowed it, saying that um, they were experts on the matter, and then some embraced it, seeing social justice as a lifelong process. So this is consistent with transformational learning, and I want to thank you so much for your time today. I'll take any questions. <laughs> you could have first. Start today. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you so much. What an interesting talk, and I'm really interested in um, uh, everything else that went on in that class. Yes. <laughs> really, during the whole semester. Yes. Um, tell me what uh, what was kind of the final assignment of the course, sure. and uh, what was I understand that you're 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 evaluating and you're categorizing the language that the students in the class used Correct. to talk about these issues. Um, tell me what a little bit more about that final assignment and yeah, how sure. that that uh, prompted some of these responses. Sure. So the final assignment was more of. Uh, asking the students to reflect on the course as a whole. Um, and also, there was a particular question that we found of interest um, that we used most of the data for time three for. And it was um, asking students to reflect on that initial assignment. So the one that they had before the course. And asking the students, would you say anything differently? How has this course shaped how you view diversity? And some students said that uh, they thought that the first part was a hoax. They thought that this entire class was um, not purposeful at all and that they didn't learn anything from it. And then some students felt as if um, they had grown so much and now they're an expert on this. Um, and now they can teach other people to be uh, culturally competent and that was it. Um, so that's like the allowing discomfort piece here. And then also some students were like, I've learned so much, I cannot believe that's where I started and that's where I am, and I can't wait to see where I go from here. And that's the embracing discomfort. So that, uh, that question, at the reflection at the final piece, really asked them to think, let's look at this journey. Where have you come? Uh, and how do you feel about it now that you're here? And where do we go from here? Could, if I could just follow up very yeah, briefly. Go for it. So for these three particular um, data gathering points, yes. were these written assignments? Yes, yes, okay. these are all written. Uh, so that's actually one of the limitations of our data. Uh, so qualitative research is uh, done either through written or through a verbal component which has been transcribed, um, that sort of thing. So that's one of our um, limitations is that this is written data and we couldn't follow up questions to that. Uh, get down to what the students might have really meant, get down to that uh, nitty and gritty, basically. And so what we're actually working on now is that we're going to follow up with the students 
and we're going to um, ask them how they view diversity now, how they view cultural competency, and if they attribute what they believe to the class or what they attribute their views on now to. So to see where we've come from, essentially, since the last timepiece. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Amy. Um, thank you. A couple of questions. The first is, if I heard you correctly, you talked about um, acknowledging or recognizing the, the whiteness or the ratio of, of white students within the class, and you yes. said something like, uh, we took a memo of it so it didn't affect our research. Yes, so one of the criticisms of qualitative research is that it is biased. Um, and so what we did to make sure that we attributed and recognized our own bias in the project was that we wrote down our reactions, our initial reactions, uh, took a break from the data, um, didn't necessarily like write down like, hey, like we didn't do the themes essentially, right then, right then, um, right there. Um, <laughs> we actually took a break from it and we came back to it, you know, kind of with a much more open mind and we talked about how our biases uh, where our biases came from, how they might impact the data, and to try and be as unbiased as possible. Of course, that in any type of research is impossible. But uh, we did want to recognize that that might have had an effect on our data. So, okay, so it's not that you're making a memo of it so it won't impact your data, but rather you're, you're, you're looking to take it into account. Yes. Uh, yes. And then my other question is, so what, what is the potential impact of this research? Yes, so with qualitative data, we like to see um, essentially what are students thinking? And we wanted to see also if these transfer, like if the different aspects of the course had an impact on their diversity, um, their views of diversity. And so what we know from the literature is that um, transfer tr transformational learning theory also um, encourages teachers to essentially have a component where they are allowed to talk through this discomfort. So instead of just dealing with it by themselves, we had a trained um, individual that was not even a part of the course. It was not graded. It was just facilitated in order to have a space where individuals were allowed to talk through it. So we wanted to see if this uh, transformational learning theory could be applied to uh, a diversity-related course in healthcare. And then we wanted to see how such a thing would have an impact on um, thoughts of diversity over the course. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Um, a, a few questions. Okay. So this, this is, uh, at least appears to me, I'm not an expert on qualitative research by any means, but it is, uh, it's kind of descriptive, yes. uh, e exploratory. Yes. And, and so, what, uh, what, what would be the ultimate purpose of the follow-up? I mean, in, in terms of, I'm thinking this is a first step to help you design uh, a, a, a experiment or experimental setting yes. to uh, achieve what end? And wh yes. what, what are you trying to uh, improve on, on with this, with this uh, line of study? So qualitative research is more uh, not about like achieving certain results, but to describe phenomenon that are occurring. So we want to follow up with students because, uh, and have interviews or focus groups to see if what we inferred by the written parts was actually occurring, if it is concurred by those students, and whether or not um, there is maybe like a time for now um, to continue that research beyond the, um, confines of the classroom to see what other, uh, what other things are impacting how they view diversity and their cultural competence in the healthcare field. Did I answer your question? I, I, I believe so. Okay. And then, you know, you, you mentioned that every, you know, every, the data were, were all in, in writing. Yes. And so yes. not without an opportunity to uh, verbally engage or right. follow up and so forth. Uh, is there any thought that such an opportunity might change uh, the attitudes that come out of the course that you're trying to, to capture? 
In other words, if the, stu if, if the students were able to, you know, to have those conversations rather than just writing things down, right. would, that, would that affect the outcome? I am not sure. I don't think so. Uh, just because uh, whenever, so whenever we looked through this data, we did it time by time. So I did not see time three until after I had done time one and time two. And that was so that we didn't like um, extrapolate that into a different time. We were looking just at that data. But using what I know now from time one, that make time one is like these three sub themes are definitely like founded um, through what we're seeing through the reflection of time one, especially even at time two, because we see that they're acknowledging that they're uncomfortable. In time one, they didn't say anything about being uncomfortable, but it's also like talking to a person if they're fidgety, you know, that sort of thing. You can also kind of um, infer to a certain extent based upon the ways that they're phrasing things if they're uncomfortable with a certain topic. So I don't necessarily think that it would change the data, so to speak. I think it would actually just further prove what we saw in each time piece. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, so this is fixing the glass. It sounds loud. All right. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here and present my research with you. My name is Courtney Martin. I am a senior biology major here at the University of Kentucky. My mentor is Dr. Nathan Vanderford in the Department of Toxicology and Cancer Biology. Cancer is the second leading cause of death in the U.S. In America, we experience 1.8 million new cases and over 600,000 cancer deaths each year. Among the entire nation, Kentucky ranks first in cancer incident and mortality with the greatest burden of the disease being found in the Appalachian region of the state. For example, lung cancer death rates are almost double that of the national average. In addition, Appalachians are 8% more likely to die from a preventable or a screenable malignancy. These disparities necessitate further investigation and action. The purpose of our research was to, to determine the reason for these high rates of cancer in Appalachia through individual perspectives. 
To do so, we recruited individuals from within the community with cancer-related experience. Participants included those working in cancer-related fields, oncology professionals, as well as those with cancer-related experience. We conducted oral history interviews at the Louis B. Nunn Center at the University of Kentucky pre-COVID. Unfortunately, our interviews were halted due to the pandemic. Each participant sat for an individual semi-structured interview, averaging two to three hours in length. These interviews were analyzed using qualitative content analysis and was categorized into themes, sub-themes, and subtopics, respectively. So some of the themes that emerged during our analysis can be seen in Figure 3, our results section, and that includes lack of access, distrust, including distrust for healthcare providers, as well as educational barriers. Appalachia, Kentucky is known for high levels of poverty. As such, lack of infrastructure means limited local healthcare facilities, making care inaccessible to many. Patients who are able to commute find themselves traveling two to three hours to the nearest local facility to obtain care. Additionally, lack of healthcare literacy or the understanding of health information is evident among Appalachians. Many physicians practicing in Appalachia often are not from the region, and this causes a deep distrust and contributes to the many fears Appalachians have regarding healthcare providers. Oftentimes, Appalachians simply do not trust outsiders. They feel as though they'll be misunderstood by those with different ways of life. This creates a barrier when engaging with the healthcare system. So, what can we do with this information and what does it mean? Increasing the access by way of utilizing telemedicine and telehealth could help bridge the gaps in accessibility to care. Except that Appalachia, Kentucky is an internet and technology desert. So this issue would also have to be addressed. Furthermore, health literacy needs to be improved among Appalachians. This has shown to increase health outcomes, including in cancer, by, for example, changing individuals' behaviors, such as those that give rise to high rates of cancer. Thank you very much. My name is Courtney Martin. I'm happy to take any questions you all have. I will jump in right away. Thank you so much. This is really fantastic and um, much needed, much needed Thank research. You. And I really appreciate what you and your whole team are doing. Um, you mentioned that you uh, recruited volunteers, not only presumably people who uh, had had a personal or family experience with cancer, but also some healthcare providers, isn't that right? And yes, other oncologists. People. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can I ask you, I, I, it's, it's such a pity that that this kind of research had to be discontinued because of COVID. But can I ask you how many people have been interviewed and do you have a large team of people? Two yeah, to three hour long interviews, that's an awful lot for you know a small team of people to take care of. Yeah, absolutely. And unfortunately, given the current pandemic, that was one of our limitations. Uh, we did end up only having uh, five participants, which of course we wanted to do on a much larger scale. However, I will say that if we had got to do more interviews, I truly believe that it would have just further supported not only our findings, but the findings other literature shows which supports our results. So again, although it was a limitation, that just gives us a drive for future studies to do this on a larger scale. Thank you for that. Excuse me. I just want to add also, I, th I think it's just fabulous that you're partnering with the Louis B. Dunn Oral History Center so that these interviews are, are now kept in a, in a database for future research of all different kinds. Um, what would you do next if you had a million dollar NSF grant to continue this research? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's an excellent question. So ultimately, we would want to do it on a larger scale. But more specifically, what I would like to see happen is that we actually implement some of these solutions, whether that's cancer education in schools or that is increasing transportation services, and follow that research and investigate the impact over time. Thank you for that question. Well, thank you as well, Courtney. Um, 
first, I, it's interesting to me, I, I confess only in my fourth year here, but having spent the last 11 years in Pennsylvania, um, you know, Appalachia, it, 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 I've been sort of surprised there, there seems kind of a possessiveness in Kentucky a little bit, that Appalachia is Kentucky. But in fact, Appalachia goes all the way up through New York State. Uh, I know it's a little bit of field from what you've presented here, but I'm curious, we, we see that dark blue all the way up. Do you think it is all related, presumably, to coal and to other things uh, of the nature of Appalachia itself, not just the state locations? Yeah, certainly. I definitely think that it is a region-specific issue. So, for example, another related study, not in Kentucky, it was just in another uh, Appalachian state, what they wanted to do was investigate the distance a patient lived from the nearest healthcare facility and determine what stage your cancer was diagnosed in in relationship to that. That study found that the further away someone lived from the nearest facility, the later the stage in which their cancer was diagnosed. And that's very unfortunate that this lack of access is not only giving rise to cancer incident, but cancer mortality. And again, I definitely think it's region specific. What we are seeing here in Kentucky is supported by other Appalachian states, such as that study. Thank you for that question. You're welcome. Now, and did you say you're a bio, uh, biology major? Yes. So, um, why did you decide to take this particular avenue in terms of your research opportunity as opposed to, say, a bench work? Absolutely. So as an Appalachian native myself, it is so dear to my heart to be able to impact my community. I've had family members and friends diagnosed with cancer, and I want to ultimately become a physician and go back to my hometown and practice. And being able to better understand the problems being faced by my community and the potential solutions and how I could potentially improve the lives and overall well-being of the place I call home is so rewarding. And I think I couldn't have found anything better that align with what I want to do. Thank yeah. you for that. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you. Nice, very nice presentation, and uh, you know certainly certainly resonates uh, in in our in our community. Um, and uh, I, I I think that you know you you've identified uh, some important problems. Uh, you've proposed solutions. Uh, have you given thought to? If, again, this is this is longer term, but let's say let's say. Uh, you know, after you get your second million dollar grant um, or $10 million grant to, uh, how, how might you test one of these interventions? So have you thought about that? So you mentioned, you know, tra transportation access uh, or different educational opportunities. Have you thought about how you would test some of those interventions and what would be the, the you know, the basis for, for forming those up? Certainly, that's an excellent question. So as mentioned, one of the problems being faced in the community is distrust. Appalachians are accent conscious, dialect conscious. They're, they just have this fear of being misunderstood. So I would certainly like to see that money go towards addressing the issue of distrust. And one way that we could do that is to create incentive programs for students to recruit Appalachian students to universities and to healthcare programs. As aforementioned in the presentation, Appalachia, Kentucky is, experiences high levels of poverty at home, some of the poorest counties in America. And that can be a barrier when wanting to go to college and pursue these advanced degrees, such as becoming a provider. So I would certainly like to see that go towards incentive programs, both to recruit physicians to come back and practice in Appalachia, but to also in recruit Appalachian students to come and be a part of these health programs and make that accessible in terms of finances. Thank you, that's a great question. Thank you all for having me.
Hi, everyone. My name's Oscar Istis. I'm a senior here at UK studying biology and entomology. And for the past several years, I've been doing research with Dr. Robin Cooper in the biology department. Our research started by taking a look at the disease septicemia, or sepsis. Some of you might have heard of this condition. It's a blood disorder that results from an immune response to a bacterial infection. Now, normally, your immune system responding to a bacterial infection would be a good thing. But in this case, it's mistargeted and too strong. So rather than getting rid of the harmful bacteria like it's supposed to, our organs and tissues end up being affected, and they frequently shut down as a result. Now, the most common targets for septicemia are patients in hospitals who are already suffering from one illness. And in the United States alone, the death rate for this disease is near 30%. Now, the actual bacterial component that's responsible for bringing about this response is a small toxin located on the outside of some bacteria called lipopolysaccharides, or LPS. And while some research has been done into how LPS actually interacts with our cells and brings about this negative response, there are still a lot of unanswered questions. Now, in order to provide a few answers, our lab turned to a model organism, the fruit fly. Now, fruit flies not only have a very well understood physiology, having been involved in research for several years, but they also have a very similar nervous system to humans. You can see that they have a brain, central nerve cord, and segmented nerves that are all very similar to humans, which not only make them easy to understand, but it also allows us to draw some comparisons between the two species. The specific life stage that we looked at were the larvae, like this little guy. We would start by mixing our LPS toxin with cornmeal to create a contaminated food mixture. We would let our larvae feed on this for a few days, then transfer them to a clean plate and give them fresh food. We would then record how much of this food they ate to see if this toxin was impacting their digestion or their ability to feed at all. After this, we would transfer them to another plate and lightly tap them on the side, like you can see here, to see how they responded to that. This would tell us if their nervous system was being impacted by this toxin at all and whether they were having any trouble responding to simple stimuli in their environment. So these two experiments, they would give us a good idea of whether these responses were similar at all to humans, at least on the outside. But the really important aspect of our research was looking at the cellular level. And to do this, we had to dissect our little larvae in such a way that we could see their nerves, like you can see here, and then insert small electrical probes into these nerves and stimulate them to get an electrical response. The electrical responses would show up as waves that we could see on a graph. They were very easy to visualize and interpret. Now, the results of our research were surprisingly positive. We saw that larvae that had been exposed to the LPS consumed significantly more food when they were given fresh food than larvae that hadn't been exposed to LPS. That means that this toxin is doing something to influence their digestion and their ability to feed normally. Similarly, we saw that larvae impacted by this toxin responded to our light touches significantly less than those that hadn't been exposed to LPS. That means that their nervous system is being dampened somehow, and that this LPS is making it harder for them to function and interact with their environment, even on a basic level. So these two examples alone show us that there are a lot of similarities between how humans demonstrate their responses to this small toxin and how fruit flies do it. But what really excited us were our responses to our intracellular recordings. While our larvae were dissected and set on our micro microscope slide, we would look at the electrical activity in their nerves before and after we washed LPS onto them. So you can see down here that before we added the LPS, the electrical responses are consistent, similar, showing that their nerves are working completely normally. But as soon as we added the LPS, that decreased immediately. It became almost impossible to determine whether responses were there at all. This shows that the toxin is doing something to mask their nervous system, making it difficult for the, the cells there to function at all or to communicate with each other. And this is incredibly similar to what we see in humans in their inability um, to keep processing with their organs and tissues as part of the septic response. So looking at this, it might not have been a very positive experience for the larvae that we were experimenting on, but we ended up finding a model organism that's not only really well understood already, but very easy to obtain that demonstrates a lot of similarities between humans. So looking at this, we hope to, in the future, not only use this organism as a way to understand the septic response better, but as a way to mitigate the threats that humans are still facing today, even in the United States. I want to thank you for your time and open myself up to any questions that you might have about my project. Uh, 
Th thank you very much. Uh, great, great job. So, um, does sepsis affect uh, the nerves or digestion in humans? Is that is, is that what you're, you're yeah, looking yeah. for? Yeah, great question. It definitely affects the nerves um, as this toxin binds to different elements of our body, including nerves, that initiates a poor immune response and our immune response attacks our nerves and other elements that these LPS toxins are binding to. So there's definitely a nervous component, which is one of the reasons that we thought fruit flies would be a great model organism for this. And some of the organs that end up shutting down as a result of this response are related to our digestive tract. And those are really visible symptoms from the outside. So we hoped that by trying to create a similar experience for these larvae, we could see if their responses were similar at all. So, so ultimately, the, the goal of, of this step in the research is just to identify a, a model that can be used to research. At the very uh, beginning, yes. Um, this toxin is relatively dangerous to work with, so obviously we can't do our experiments on humans um, or a lot of other organisms. So taking it from the bare minimum fruit fly is the first step to better understanding this toxin and how we can then compare that to humans. Jump in. Um, I know that a lot of different kinds of research have been done on fruit flies over the years, over the decades. Um, if you were to take this type of research to another organism, what's kind of the next step? I assume that many other different kinds of research projects have started out with a fruit fly and then For gone sure. on to something next. What's next, the mouse or, you know, are there, are there other things that are sort of typical in that progression for uh, examining something like this, the, the, the nervous activity of, a, yeah. of an organism? Great question. So this research, after I completed doing this, other members of my lab um, already started tackling working with other model organisms um, at a very basic level. So the next step after this was working with crayfish, which have a slightly more advanced nervous system, um, but it's still very well understood, and a lot of labs even here on campus utilize them for nervous activity studies. Um, so after we moved on from crayfish, we've started doing very minimal research on samples of human brain, actually. So we are definitely not at a point where we'll ever be able to test this with live humans, um, but we've gotten samples of important tissues and organs, and we're starting to see how this toxin impacts them. Um, and all of that kind of started with, with this project and looking at how it affected fruit flies. Thank you. One of the things I really enjoyed about your talk is that you really walked us through exactly what that research looks like. Thank you. And I really appreciate that. That was fascinating to me. It's also just amazing that you're working with something that's so tiny, right? M microscopes <laughs> were involved every step of the way. And the fact that you're measuring how much cornmeal the poor thing eats, that's got to be, what, like two grains of cornmeal or something? Per we actually per measured it meal. by... Um, looking at their mouth parts under a microscope and seeing how many times they extended them to intake food over the course of a few minutes. So it's definitely easier than having to measure the cornmeal before and after they fed, um, but it was still a little rigorous. So Oscar, thank you. Um, first, I want to ask, uh, the, the provost asked you about the, the nerves and the hunger. My, my understanding from sepsis is that um, it's often referred to simply as a, I mean, it's, it's a blood infection. It, mm -hmm. it, it engages uh, the blood. And um, can you give me some sense of, is that just part of the same and just extending out to the other system, or is that something different that's going on? Is that Blood is definitely the area where it, it affects the most. Um, as this toxin enters the bloodstream, mm -hmm. that's what kind of initiates the immune response that ends up affecting the rest of the body. Um, the bloodstream is where most of the um, cells related to your immune system are, like the white blood cells. Um, so as they, as this toxin enters the bloodstream and from there travels to organs and nervous tissue, um, the immune cells in the bloodstream follow. So we are taking a look at after they've already gotten to the organs, after they've already gotten to the tissue and nerve cells, and seeing the response from there. So I have to <coughs> apologize if I, my demeanor, uh, we lost our son to sepsis. So I just... Thank you for this research. I'm so sorry well about done. that. Thank you for your time, everyone.
Hi, my name is Olivia Huffman. I am a senior psychology major here at the University of Kentucky. I'm also a student athlete on the swimming and dive team, and I am part of the P20 Motivation and Learning Lab under Dr. Ellen Usher. Student athletes not only face adjusting to the normal college demands in academic life, like taking harder classes, but they also have to learn to adjust to the rigorous athletic demands like training and competition. This may make the transition from high school to college more difficult for student athletes than non-athletes. I also noticed within my first year that people tend to make assumptions about student athletes' academic abilities. They genuinely, generally tend to assume that we aren't as academically capable as our non-athlete peers and they make stereotypes about our abilities. So this made me wonder, do academic self-beliefs of student athletes differ from non-student athletes within their first year of college? Specifically, we wanted to look at mindset abilities and self-efficacy. On your left-hand side of the screen, I describe um, mindset abilities, and that is people's uh, perceptions about their ability to improve upon their abilities or if their ability is more fixed. So students may think people's math ability is something about them that they can't change very much. On the right hand side of the screen, I describe self-efficacy or confidence. Students may think, I can master the skills taught in my STEM classes. So our P20 Motivation and Learning Lab conducted a study over three years where we surveyed over 6,000 first-year undergraduate students on their academic self-beliefs. And these surveys were given within their first semester of college. Of that 6,000, 122 were student athletes. And we used propensity score matching to select an equivalent um, comparison group of non-athletes based on race, gender, high school um, achievement, and first generation status. From that, we then compared our means for students in each group. For fixed mindset, you can see our results in this graph on the left um, with the effect sizes in green. Student athletes reported marginally different higher levels of fixed intelligence abilities and fixed math abilities. So this means that they have a more rigid view about these abilities. For self-efficacy, um, again, our effect sizes are in green, but students reported significantly lower um, reports of self-efficacy in the humanities subjects than non-athletes. So why might these differences exist? One of the reasons that we thought of was that student athletes coming out of high school might be more calibrated about their abilities than non-student athletes. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, we are getting critiqued and criticized by our coaches, and this could lead us to have a more realistic understanding of our abilities, which, um, but this is definitely something that needs to be investigated more and is in our next steps. However, I was surprised to find that student athletes reported higher levels of fixed mindset for intelligence and math ability. Uh, we work really hard in and out of our sport, and we can tangibly see improvements in um, our peers and ourselves athletically, but these experiences aren't seeming to translate into the classroom. So as coaches and teachers, we need to make sure that we are supporting student athletes as they transition from high school to college. And one way we can do this is by challenging fixed mindsets and helping students develop a growth mindset. And we can do this by um, using effort-based feedback instead of performance-based feedback. Second, we can support student athletes, um, uh, we can support their confidence in the humanities subjects by providing them with more support academically in those subjects, and that could look li like giving them more tutors or a mentor for their humanities courses. And third, we need to emphasize the power of beliefs in sport and school. So not just focusing on 
athletic abilities, but also focusing on academic um, abilities for student athletes. And by doing this, we are going to help student athletes develop not only in their sport, but also help them excel academically in the classroom. Thank you so much for your time. I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed this talk. And uh, it just makes me think about all different kinds of ways to approach this particular problem. Um, uh, I wonder, uh, it's quite interesting that you did find differences between the athletes and the non-athletes. I wouldn't necessarily have assumed that that was the case. And so my first question to you is, um, did you consider, uh, 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 did you consider asking them questions that would ascertain whether these students had a kind of fixed mindset about their own athletic skills? So for example, you know, some people might just say, I'm, I'm born fast, or you know, I'm, I'm born a good swimmer, or whatever it is. Uh, and that, that if, if that's how they perceive their own success athletically, maybe that's, how, maybe that's a direct translation to their perceptions of their academic ability that you would consider? Yes, this is definitely something we consider. So for this study, we just looked at academic self-beliefs, and we weren't able to compare it to athletic um, beliefs. But this is definitely something that I want to do in grad school. Um, I know athletes, there's scales out there that measure academic or athletic identity and how that would play a role in academic outcomes. Um, but yes, that is a great question. Just to follow up, again, it's just wonderful to be able to compare um, athletic, uh, athletic performance versus academic performance. Um, I was interested to hear that one of your recommendations is that students should receive uh, effort-based feedback versus performance-based feedback. Um, is that what happens on the, on the training field or in the, in, the, in the locker room with the coach? Um, are you saying that this is like something that coaches could do? Yeah, yeah. so I think, I guess that as an example from my life, um, say I'm having a dual meet as a swim meet against um, some other SEC school, and we, we might lose. Instead of the coach saying, oh my gosh, you guys lost, we can't get any better, they can say, okay, your effort was really, really good, we did some things right, we did some things wrong. Let's see how we can improve upon this and get better and grow. And so that's kind of how you develop this growth mindset. Um, and that the coaches can also do this for academics. Um, they get reports of our grades every week and they can check in and be like, hey, like I noticed you're struggling in your math class. Like, what's going on? And if the student is like, I mean, I've just been failing, like I don't know how to improve. That's where the coach can say, you know what, keep trying, put some more effort in, and if you are putting in all the effort you can, let's figure out a way to get you to where you need to be academically as well. So, thank you. Thank you very much, that's wonderful. Thank you very much, Olivia. Um, first, we'll start with my ignorance. Uh, tell me our, on our scale, what is, is T and P, or is that row, tau and row, but what, what are they indicating? So P is your significance, um, and if you have a significance of less than 0.05, that's like significant, but ours are marginally, so you can't necessarily say that they are significant. And then P, okay, so I'm our statistician in the lab um, who is on a co-author to this, she was the one who inserted T, but I believe it is the difference in the mean I believe. <laughs> the, if she the explained finance that person correctly, is nodding his head. So I'll, I'll <laughs> go with that. If I explain, yeah. Okay. Well, because that, that's it's not my area. Um, what do you think? So you said you did this with first year students, right? Um, do you think, or, or are you all considering surveying at, at later years in the college career? Because my guess would be, my hypothesis would be that, especially if you could track the same 400 or 244 folks that you would see changes in their, uh, their perceptions of themselves as they grow and they develop. Is that something, wh what would you hypothesize? Um, yeah, so that's definitely something that 
I would again want to look at. Uh, I don't know if we are going to be doing that, but um, I would definitely hypothesize that college, like from the literature, we know that college is kind of like a mini life cycle for mm -hmm. all students. Um, but for student athletes, especially in my own life, when I was a freshman, I was not, I didn't believe in myself as much as I do now as a senior. And so I definitely think there's going to be differences in growth mindset and in self-efficacy. Um, I, for one, definitely have grown so much without, like, throughout my college career, and so I definitely think there would be differences. And finally, I have to ask, what are your events? Um, I swim 50 freestyle and, like, 100 freestyle and then backstroke, so 100 and 200. Those were my events as well. <laughs> Th thank you, Olivia. So, uh, so you, your, your instrument measures fixed mindset versus growth mindset and I'm I'm just envisioning that that there's a there's a continuum there or a distribution if you will that that is that is perhaps not symmetric Thank so you. that you know I'm a, a a high fixed mindset may not necessarily imply a low growth mindset so just you know, and, and so I, I think your examples pointed to uh, the, the coaching process as encouraging a, a growth mindset. And I, I, I was also an intercollegiate athlete, and I remember some of those speeches that you described. It's just that, <laughs> that they were much louder and, and, and laced with profanity. But, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, so d just as a, su a suggestion, maybe you know, comment on how you might approach that. And that's, so that's, that's uh, my first question. Yeah, no, that's definitely great. I think, um, so the way that we asked, we didn't necessarily say this is measuring fixed mindset. We asked students, what are, or we asked students, do you believe that your math ability can be improved? And so they asked out of a scale of one to four, um, or they answered a scale of one to four, zero being I can change my abilities, for being, I cannot change my abilities in math. So if that answers your question. Yeah, it, do, it, it does. I might, have, I might have framed the presentation a little differently to emphasize the, okay. the growth side of it. But yeah, yeah it, makes, uh, it makes sense. And then um, with your propensity s uh, score uh, matching, did the, the non-athlete side of the sample have the same proportion of uh, females, URM, et cetera? Yeah, so we did this to control for any selection bias. So what you see for athletes is what you see for our non-student athletes. And, and uh, were both sides randomly selected or convenience? Um, so the surveys were given to um, first year students, well, all students, but in their writing classes. So I guess kind okay. of convenient sample. Okay, but I, I guess on the, on the athlete side, so it, it was tied to their enrollment in that right, particular right. class. Right, right, yeah. So you, and you know, one, one, one certainly could argue there may be some variation ag across sports. Definitely, and, definitely. And so, and, uh, so that's, that's probably something to, to look at uh, uh, in, in the future um, for sure and having uh, as, as a faculty member, having taught an, a lot of intercollegiate athletes, there, there, are, there are some fundamentally different attributes across students that select a particular sport versus <laughs> another. I sat next to a member of the swim team at University of Tennessee in accounting, and, and that, that was the most disciplined person I'd ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much for your comments and questions. I also would like to thank you. I th believe you funded the larger part of this study. So thank you so much for that. Um, also, I would just like to say that differentiating sports regarding academics, I think is super important. And unfortunately, we couldn't do it with this, but that is something that I am working on and hopefully we can do something with the different sports. So thank you.
Hello. Thank you all for being here. My name is Kaylee Bolton. I am a sophomore in biology major at the University of Kentucky. And today I will be presenting abnormal accumulation of glycogen and altered glycosylation in brain tumors. Imagine the University of Kentucky's rub arena filled completely to its capacity with people. This arena can hold 23,500 people, and yet to visualize the number in of individuals expected to receive a brain tumor diagnosis this year alone would take nearly four rep arenas. It is estimated that 87,240 people will be diagnosed with a brain tumor in 2020. Nearly one-fifth of the individuals who receive a brain cancer diagnosis are expected to die fighting that cancer. And those who do live are at a higher risk of living with impaired cognition and physical health. The composition of brain tumors is both diverse and complex, and these qualities cause them to be difficult to diagnose and treat effectively. Two characteristics have been connected to the progression of brain cancer, abnormal accumulation of glycogen and altered glycosylation. Glycogen is the main storage form of glucose and as such acts as an energy currency for the body. Glycosylation is a modification in which sugars called glycans are attached to biomolecules to modulate their structure and function. With these characteristics in mind, we conducted a study analyzing the molecular profile of 106 human samples whose initial brain cancer grade level varied from 1 to 4. We first conducted a tissue microarray sectioning of these samples to prepare them for tests. Then, the first technique we utilized was immunohistochemistry, or IHC as I'll refer to it throughout the duration of this presentation, coupled with HALO imaging software. IHC is the traditional method whereby tumors are scored in the pathology lab and is a technique to identify biomarkers taking advantage of the relationship between antibodies and antigens. The antibody that we used is against glycogen. The second technique we then utilized was mass spectrometry imaging, or MSI as I'll refer to it throughout the rest of this presentation. MSI is a novel methodology that has recently been used to analyze the sugar composition in lung cancer, but has not yet been applied to brain tumors. MSI is a powerful tool for the visualization of biomolecules using their molecular mass and can be used to classify tumors, produce molecular images with substantial spatial resolution, and collect significant biochemical information. We then took the results of the glycogen and glycan abundances from each technique to analyze and further understand the role of glycogen and glycosylation in the progression of brain cancer. The first results we collected were pertaining to glycogen and taken from both the IHC and MSI platforms. As you can see in figures 2A and 2C, there is a direct relationship between glycogen abundancy and brain cancer grade level. This is also visually represented in figure 2B with the halo images and in figure 2D with the MSI images, where cooler colors correspond to lower amounts of glycogen and hotter colors correspond to higher amounts of glycogen. We then collected more results pertaining to glycosylation. These results were taken solely from the MSI platform. And as you can see in figure 2E, there is a connection between glycan abundancy and therefore glycosylation and brain cancer grade level. For some glycans, as abundancy increases, brain cancer grade level also increases, similarly as to the glycogen. However, for other glycans, as abundancy decreases, brain cancer grade level increases. This is true for the select glycan 1257 that is also visually represented in figure 2F. You can see that the control image is dominated by mostly hot colors, representing a high glycan abundancy. And then, as brain cancer grade level increases throughout the images, they become dominated by cool colors, showing a decrease in that abundancy. Overall, our results are important because they reveal significant insight into the composition of brain tumors. We hope to conduct further research into related mechanisms, and excitingly, the MSI platform has recently been utilized in the clinic for lung cancer to define the edges of cancer tissue and guide resections. We hope that our work may also be utilized to guide these critical decisions in the clinic. And with further research, our work may lead to the discovery of biomarkers and novel targets for the diagnosis and treatment of metastasizing brain tumors in humans. If the signs of brain cancer are more extensively recognized and earlier interference in the progression of the disease can occur, 
And this advancement is pertinent to the standard of living of the estimated over 700,000 people living in the United States today with a brain tumor. Thank you for listening to my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank uh, well, you. well done. Kaylee, is that how you pronounce it? Yes, Kaylee. Kaylee. Excellent. Thank you. Um, oh, I got a couple of questions for you. I really do. So first, you said about 87,000 per year. Mm -hmm, um, are diagnosed with a brain tumor. Is that in the United States or globally? Globally. So that's, that's a global number. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, not terribly reassuring either, but you know. Um, and again, this goes under, as many things tonight, my ignorance. Um, mm -hmm. But the, so the, the presence of glycans uh, in certain cases, um, or the, was it the decrease in the glycans, increase in the severity of the cancer? Glycogen is the opposite. So can you just clarify for me again the difference between glycogen and glycans? Because it's all sugars. Yes. Right? Yes, these are both sugars, and they're both very important for our bodily function. With glycogen, it's going to be the carrier of glucose. As we talked about earlier in some of the other presentations, glucose is a complex carbohydrate that is very important for our metabolism, specifically in glycosylation. Or, sorry, yes, the, the glycogen um, in our meta meta metabolic pathways. And then glycans are important because they're also sugars. However, they are more important for in the cells. They can attach to things like proteins and affect how those proteins function and their structures. So both sugars and very important in metabolism, but a little bit different in the functions. That's great. Thank you. And then I've got a sort of very theoretical. I, I really appreciated the fact that you, you talked about what the potential applications and implications of this, this is uh, and in the importance of, of early diagnosis. But it seems to me one of the challenges with, with these sorts of cancers is that um, you have no reason to go in and do scanning or do tests until it's fairly far along. Um, again, beyond what you've, you've said here, I'm just curious your thoughts on, on how, how there gets to be a better um, awareness of, of when to go ahead and make these sorts of tests. What, what is it that we can do to, to help, um, if we're gonna have 87,000, how do we get to them early enough to have more therapeutic treatment? Yes, I believe that right now this is a very invasive test and not everybody is going to be getting their brain tissue taken for testing. So right now that is a limitation, but with further research, we're hoping that if we can find other biomarkers that we can look at and find these similar connections, that we can use those instead to potentially find high risk patients. One example could be cerebral spinal fluid, which is still invasive, but much less invasive than taking brain tissue. Thank you for your questions. Uh, so what, what led you to believe that glycogen and glycans would uh, have a role in, in revealing the, 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 I guess, the extent of the malignancy or the the extent of the cancer. Thank you. Um, in our lab, we study a lot of different glycogen storage diseases. Um, and so when we are doing metabolomics and looking at potentially very important metabolites in different kinds of samples, there are many diseases that we're looking at, such as Lefora disease, um, different types of cancers like brain cancer, Ewing sarcoma. So it, it, it is a theme that we go in with our lab. We're looking at different diseases that we can target glycogen and it's going to be important. So it's what we're looking for kind of going into it with multiple different diseases. With, with respect to, let's use glycogen, gly, glycogen as, as an example, uh, why, why, do, why do we see the increased prevalence of glycogen as you increase in the you know, grades of, of the uh, cancer? I do believe that that is a little out of the scope of this particular study, but that is something we're definitely thinking about. And we, right now we're seeing that this is a connection, that we are seeing these patterns, but in order to really pin down why it's happening, that's where we'd have to do the further research into related like metabolic pathways and those kinds of things. Thank you for your questions. So um, 
just uh, let me ask a question for clarification. These are actual um, physical samples of human brains that you're sectioning here and then examining with different types of instrumentation. Yes, ma'am. And so I think you said before that not, not everyone is going to have that kind of um, intervention, so to speak, until m maybe quite late in, their, in the development of their um, disease. Uh, is there a possibility then that, th that uh, you see down the road that glycogen could be examined through some non-invasive technique? Or is this the kind of uh, cell, really a cell-based study that requires the, the physical sample directly on the, on, the, on the slide under the microscope? I do believe that it will need to be somewhat invasive, like I was saying. We may be able to find biomarkers that are less invasive, such as the cerebral spinal fluid. But um, as of right now, it is still very invasive. And there are ways that this can also translate into a surgical kind of aspect, like I was talking with the lung cancer. So if somebody is getting a tumor removed, something like this would be good because a mass spectrometry knife could be used, where as the um, surgeon is cutting out the tumor, they can see in real time where the edges of the tumor are, and it can guide them. So it can not only be a tool in diagnosing, um, diagnostics, but also in treating the cancer or removing the tumor. That's fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, it does. Yes. It's, it's not being used for brain tumors, but it's very excitingly being used for lung cancer in the clinic. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Miranda Kunis. I am a senior in the equine science and management major in the College of Agriculture, Food and Environment with a minor in, Ger in German. I have been conducting equine nutrition research with Dr. Lori Lawrence. Today I will be talking to you about how equine nutritionists use a horse's feces to better understand how they digest their food. Horses are grazing herbivores, which means they consume diets primarily consisting of high cellulose forage feeds, such as grasses and hays. 
However, modern management practices often supplement these high forage diets with high starch diets. This is in the cases of horses that have an extreme energy output, such as racing thoroughbred horses. Both cellulose and starch are long chains of glucose molecules. However, they differ in the linkages between those molecules. Cellulose, its linkages are not able to be digested by the horse's own enzymes. So instead, the horse makes use of a microbial community that lives commensally in its large intestine. These microbes have their own enzymes that can ferment cellulose into a product that is usable for the horse for energy. Starch's linkages, however, can be digested by the horse's own enzymes. This occurs in small amounts in the small intestine. However, as what sometimes occurs is the horse is fed too much starch, in which case the enzymes are overloaded and the excess starch flows into the large intestine, where it is also fermented by those microbes. This can be detrimental for the horse's health as it disrupts the microbial community there in its balance and creates an acidic environment in the horse's hind gut or large intestine. To better understand this phenomenon and how it impacts the horse, we utilize a DAISY ANCOM incubation system. This incubator contains four jars that we use for different treatment groups. Each jar would contain buffer solutions and fresh feces collected from the horse. These feces provide the microbes from the horse's large intestine. In the incubator, the jars are kept warm at the horse's internal body temperature, rotated to mimic the natural movements of the horse's intestine, and oxygen is removed to, pr to promote the health of the microbes. Overall, this creates an in, in vitro experimental setup that mimics the hindgut digestion of the horse. Our particular question, though, was how does the decrease in pH that comes from fermentation of excess starch affect the digestion of the cellulose, the horse's main dietary component? To do this, we use this incubation system and specialized filter bags to study the digestion of these different nutrients. The pH in each jar was changed to a different amount, some acidic, some more basic. And then cellulose or Timothy hay was added to the bags and were measured before and after incubation to look at the digestion or disappearance of these substrates. You can see here the different pHs that we started at. The blue line indicates our most acidic jar at about 6.5 pH, while the green line indicates the most basic jar at about 7.6. Over the 48-hour incubation period, all four jars experienced a decrease in pH, suggesting that fermentation was indeed happening. However, what exactly was happening to the cellulose in each of these jars? If you look at the bar graph here, the blue lines indicate the digestion of the Timothy Hay forage sample, and the red bars indicate the digestion of the cellulose samples. As you can see, the blue bars remain about the same for all four treatment groups. However, you can see a difference based upon the pH in the red jars, in the red bars with the cellulose digestion. The most basic jar had the greatest amount of cellulose digestion at about 40%. However, as you go down in pH, the cellulose digestion also decreases, with the most acidic jar having about half the amount of digestion as the most basic jar. We can conclude from these results that reducing pH decreases cellulose digestion. In the future, we'll try to use different amounts of starch to regulate the pH and see how that correlates to cellulose digestion differences. So you might be asking yourself right now, that's great, but why do I care about what a horse eats? And for that question, I would remind us about how critical the horse is to the spirit of the state of Kentucky. But not only that, it's critical to the economy of our state. In Fayette County alone, equine-related assets make up a multi-billion dollar industry. So as we improve the health of the horse, we work to improve the well-being of our state as a whole. Thank you, and I can answer any questions that you may have. So I may have, I may have missed this, but how, how does it affect the health of the horse? So, so the, the fact that, uh, if I'm understanding correctly, the, the cellulose does not digest properly, 
gets into the large intestine where it disrupts the other microbes. So what is, what is the impact of that on the horse's health or yes. the performance? Yes. So cellulose is always digested in the large intestine. And when the enzymes in the small intestine that digest starch are overloaded, and they can't function, they can't take on any more starch, that passes into the large intestine. And that's where it gets more complicated, because I mentioned it was a microbial community. So there's different participants in that community that function in different roles. And so when the starch utilizing bacteria uh, get all this excess starch, they proliferate and jump up. And they're taking over resources that would be used by the cellulolytic one, but they're also creating an acidic environment, which is not hospitable for the cellulolytic or cellulose utilizing bacteria. So it prevents them from doing their job because they're doing their job too much. But also, so that just makes it like disrupted and unbalanced, but these dis, uh, lack, the lack of balance can lead to other health problems that can like be detrimental to the horse, as in like it could, you would need a veterinarian, they could, what's called colic, which is an extreme gastrointestinal distress, which often horse owners know like your horse could die from that. Um, and if it's in, there's too much starch, it can create an, um, a phenomenon called acidosis, or it's down to a pH of five, which we didn't even touch here. And in that case, like you just need extreme veterinary care. So while it creates less than optimal conditions and amounts like these, it can lead to the horse's death if it's fed in even more excess. So a better understanding of, of these processes, would that lead um, uh, uh, farmers to better feeding practices or different feeding practices? What would it, what would it tell them what to do? Yes, there's an education component, which uh, the College of Agriculture has extension programs that reach out into the community and like we have this research in the lab, but we need the horse owners and farmers to know the information. So there's that aspect of, Please don't feed your horse too much starch if it doesn't need it. But as I mentioned earlier, this is done a lot for horses like thoroughbreds or other performance horses that they need a lot of energy. And starch is a really um, easily accessible form of that. So we can use this information to better inform our management practices for those horses that need more, as such as switching to a high energy feed that uses maybe more fat instead of starch. Uh, so a different nutrient class or changes the management practices such as feeding throughout the day versus one time in the morning. And so there's horses that need energy from this source, but the way it's done can be detrimental. You're welcome. That, so you're uh, explaining what I was just thinking of, which is that um, basically the, 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 horse, the horse under certain circumstances, such as a thoroughbred on race day, needs the extra energy, and yet the feeding practices that provide that extra energy also may be likely to cause health problems in the digestion of the horse. So you're trying to figure out how to have your cake and eat it too, <laughs> yes. or something <laughs> like that, right? For, the <laughs> for, for our equine friends. Um, so uh, uh, would, it, would this be similar with other animals that are related to the horse, like for donkeys and so on? Presumably they have the pretty much a similar um, digestive tract with some of the same issues and problems. Yeah, so donkeys are also equids, equines. Sure. Uh, so very similar. Uh, donkeys are so much hardier. We have a professor who studies them across the globe in different working environments. and. Donkeys can survive on so much. So that would definitely be the case, but um, they might not have as many like as much energy output. Um, the cool thing about animal science and nutrition though is that beyond like equine, uh, the, like in cattle or in, uh, those are also called like, ruminant animals, so that includes sheep and goats. And then in pigs, like everything is so different. Like the, they all have the same components for the most part in their digestive tracts, but their function and needs are so different. So. Yes, a lot of this would apply to a donkey or a, perhaps a mule, but it'd be vastly different for a cow. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the paper. Uh, I really don't want to sound flippant, but I'm going to. <laughs> yes. Because um, I know, I can't think of an example now, but I know that not, not animals can flatulate. Can a horse toot? <laughs> yes, I work on a farm, and yes. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, we, had, we had sheep, so um, I knew they did. Um, because that, I was thinking about the gastric distress. Yes. So your suggestion here is that, that the, the impact of this study is, is not to give them Tums to you know, increase the, the pH and so forth, but rather 
to really adjust the diet on the front end. And, um, and, and what would, when you talk about cellulose, I think yeah. you have paper there as an example of that. Yes. What, what, what would they be actually, what would the feed actually be that, that is a cellulose-based diet? Yes. So your first question, um, I totally blank. Can you repeat the first part? You had two oh, parts Oh, I there. was talking about tooting. Um, <laughs> but, but no, I was saying that, so you're, you're, you're recommending that they would simply change the diet, not that you would uh, add yes. something to it, like a yes. Tums for horses. And then what was cellulose component? So yeah, so I've had the, uh, the question about Tums in the preliminary round, and I think that's a great example. Uh, I'm not very creative. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so Tums would, would provide a buffer. However, that acts in the horse's stomach, and yeah. where it's an acidic environment. And there's actually neutral, pH neutralizing uh, mechanisms in the horse's small intestine. So because we're feeding this front end, that it's causing problems that can't be reversed by something like Tums that acts in the stomach. So yes, we have to change um, the management practices and how we feed and what exactly we feed um, versus just giving another um, medicine, medication. And then your question about cellulose. Uh, yes, yeah, so I used to cut up strips of filter paper here because paper is virtually all cellulose. Uh, and actually, this Timothy Hay would have a cellulose component. When you think about uh, plants, uh, the, structural, so the structural component is a carbohydrate of cellulose. And so if you're looking at a, a piece of grass, like what's keeping it standing up is, is basically cellulose. And as um, the plant matures and gets older, it's going to become more stemmy and harder, um, and that increases the cellulose. So um, in most of their forage diets, when they're eating grass or they're eating hay, that's where they're getting a lot of cellulose. And there's less starch there because those plants don't store as much glucose in this form. So I, what I was curious about is wh what is it that they're feeding horses that's high in cellulose um, for, for that energy? What would, what oh, would high in starch. Or starch, yes, okay. I'm sorry. What, what would that be? What would that look like? Yeah, so there's lots of feeds you can do. Uh, lots of different feed companies create concentrate diets that have high energy. And they use lots of different components, but some of the main things you'd look at are oats or perhaps corn. And corn is um, it's not ideal to feed to horse. Like, it's high energy, but the form it, it's in um, just creates more of these problems, whereas oats is like slightly more accessible, so you can feed less, but get the right energy where you need it. Um, so there's even like that shift in how you feed it, because all the plants are so different. So they're more like pellets or grains that you would feed them. Great, thank you very much. You're welcome. I just had a, 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 a follow-up. Yes. I, I'll probably show my lack of creativity too. Uh, but uh, as a human, uh, over a certain age with certain issues, um, I, I take a, a supplement every day that uh, puts the right kind of bacteria in my gut. So is there, is there any such thing for our, our equine friends? Yes, I take probiotics too. Everyone should look into them, they're great. Um, but yeah, that, that does already exist. People do use some probiotics, especially when you treat horses for problems with antibiotics, it completely disrupts even more like, than this, the horse's hind gut health. Um, so our next steps after using starch to, to uh, um, change the pH would be to see if we can mitigate this in vitro in the experimental setup with probiotics and prebiotics, which support bacteria. Um, but it'd also be a whole different ballgame in vivo in the actual horse. Again, because I mentioned like the acidic environments here, and you have to find ways to encapsulate them so they get to where you want. And then we're also trying to discover there's so many species of bacteria. Uh, which ones are the best ones? Which ones do we want to supplement? Presumably, Alltech is going to be funding your next research project. <laughs> they fund a lot of uh, our research, yeah, sure um, they do. and I think they're a very interesting company for sure. <laughs> hey, Miranda, I have one question yes. for you. As an equine owner, um, why did you decide on Timothy Hay and not alfalfa or an alfalfa mix? Yes. Um, so there's different types of hays that people feed, and they come from different plants. So her question is, why do we use this one, Timothy hay, versus a different one, such as alfalfa or an orchard grass? And uh, for this study mainly, it was because we have used this sample many, many times for this process. And it was functioning in this experiment as like a control to see if our process was even working. Because um, with the nature of these bacteria and the feces, you could accidentally kill them, you couldn't be warm enough and transferring from the farm to the lab. And so we really want to make sure that when we're getting these results for the cellulose, 
that those are accurate and reliable results. And so we just mostly needed a forage sample that we could rely on to be consistent. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm a senior in the Honors College studying sociology, philosophy, and English, and this research pertains to my minor in Appalachian Studies. Oh, and I'm sorry, I meant to say also, my mentor is Dr. Edward Morris, um, and I'd also like to thank Dr. Catherine Engel, um, who helped with my research in Appalachian Studies, and then my family, um, who is really instrumental in everything I thought. So after hearing the phrase Appalachian strong woman used to refer to a woman who was emphasizedly less feminine by urban standards, who was a primary wage earner for a family, and who was a primary household carer, I decided to investigate this archetypal figure in my home area. And I realized that there was something that I, I found in literature, there was, there was no mention of this phrase at all, so I ran with that. Um, and I strongly believed that this figure was happening in increasing a, a wave um, in this period of time after a wave in the 21st century, a wave in the War on Poverty 1960s, and a wave in the 1980s. This one was due to a post-coal post economic downturn. And you can see in figure one, this is an example of the archetype in the early 21st century. This woman is Arizona. She was both an equal contributor in subsistence farming for her family and later primary contributor, but also a primary household carer. So she's just the prime example here. So after this, I decided to conduct research on my own, and I conducted 10 oral history interviews and 150 in-depth surveys with Eastern Kentuckians, asking them demographic information, um, their familial backgrounds, their employment history, and some complex views on gender and house. From this, you can see in figure two, of the rural women that were surveyed that belonged to a household, 68% of them were the primary wage earner for that family, which is extremely high. And then in addition, here on figure three, you can see these colors, highest and lowest, are rural men and rural women, and there's a marked difference in how they reported to me that they spent their hours in household labor during a day. There's multiple reasons for this. The women surveyed were higher in all in-house tasks. Um, I've only listed four of them here for you for size. Now after this, there were people that asked me, is this something that is really distinct to Appalachia? And I wanted to say yes, hoped to say yes. So I conducted a new leg, and I decided to interview again 10 people through oral history methods, and then another 100 through um, survey methods. Each of these people were solely urban lived individuals that now live in Lexington, Kentucky. And the numbers were different. So the equivalent of this pie chart for women that were surveyed, again, belonging to households, 
only 39% of them were wage earners. So big difference. And then in daily involvement, you can see numbers for urban women and urban men. And as usual, watching children is the highest peak for them, but there's significantly less difference between the way that they share their day, at least in these four tasks. There's um, some statistical significance also between um, wage earning and within the way that tasks are shared between rural and urban environments. So from what I have conducted myself and then in reading and work with other stellar academics and journalists, I've concluded that really women in Appalachia are really conducting more inside and outside labor in the home due to rigid, extremely rigid, binary hegemonic masculinity. And these gender views mean that. They think that men and women are default genders for the most part and that men ought solely be performing um, technical jobs, manual labor tasks, and that women ought to be providing solely household and familial labor or caregiving jobs. Now, the post-coal part of this, after coal jobs have disappeared, men have either been uncomfortable for the most part to change their career field or unable to change their career field. And this, this means women have been the change in force of retraining in primarily education and nursing fields. As I see in my hometown, it's the University of Pikeville and Pikeville Medical Center. But this is common through Eastern Kentucky, which I've studied. So there's some implications here. I think the implications suggest that there needs to be work in public policy and in other fields to increase flexibility in gender views in general, because economies are directly tied, I think, to views on work and on gender. We can change what's happening in Appalachia if we can change how people think they can do things or what they should be doing. Women that I've interviewed now, they're emotionally and physically exhausted. Women like Macy, who told me, I've got to put food on the table, paid for and cooked. And she does so much work. So what I hope to do is honor, one, the past contributions that they've made. People like my grandmother, who thankfully had a spouse that didn't put her in the same position of doing it all by herself. But I also want to alleviate their need for future work. Thank you. Emily, thank you very much. I uh, love this. Um, I've seen her many times in the last two years in mm -hmm. presentations. Um, and and this, this is fascinating to me. Um, I, I my research area is ancient Hebrew and Jewish literature. I deal in patriarchal societies all the time. <laughs> and so this just seems completely counterintuitive and, and until you dropped in that nugget about the post coal. Mm. Um, I appreciated the way that you talked about implications. So my, my main question for you is, as you think about how to make that impact, where do you go? Is it the women or the men who need to be educated? And what does that education look like? How do you think, I mean, we, we heard earlier this evening uh, about the, uh, the distrust um, of Appalachian communities and people coming from outside um, or even within, but bringing, as it might be viewed, ideas from outside in. Um, so so what, what would that look like? Who would you start with? Would it be the men? Would it be the women? And what would the message be? Right. Thank you for asking. So I, I think for first two things I definitely want to say. Um, I don't ever wish to malign <laughs> my people. Um, so I, I do everything I do hoping to make a change. And I, I felt like at some point it was really unfortunate that people were put in this position. So I wanted to confirm it was happening <laughs> before I then got out there and, and hopefully did something to change it. Um, and then second, I, I've done additional things since my first year of work as well um, to be more inclusive in, in gender. Um, because if I disagree <laughs> with the binary view of things, I have to be willing to include people outside of the binary as well. Um, so receiving survey data has allowed me to instead not get all of the responses from like cis white women who, who talked to me, um, but from agender people, from non-binary people, and I want to make the point that Appalachia is not monolithic, even if I've got, you know, a breakdown between men and women. Um, my mentor pointed out really greatly saying, I think your work is significantly in masculinities more than anything else. And I think when I started, it was kind of just like an issue of, wow, women do so much stuff. <laughs> like, women are really cool. Um, and it was hero worship at first, and, and now I'm recognizing it's just incredibly wrong to um, even be touting it that much and to see it as a problem. So I, I think addressing men, um, and I think particularly addressing young men um, in Appalachia, I think there definitely needs to be a concerted effort 
um, within schools or programming or something else to basically say, you know, you're not just limited to the military, a coal job, or a welding job. Like, there are things you can do other than that that it's valuable to be a dancer if you can go someplace else. It's valuable to be an educator. Um, you know, there's, there's other things that you can be doing in the region and outside of the region, and just, I think, it's, it's a chicken or egg. If people feel like they can't do a certain type of job, it may not be here for us. Great. Thank you, Emily. Go ahead. I love this kind of uh, time use survey. Um, and uh, uh, this is what you have here from your own research is really very impressive. I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to see that you did uh, interviews both with rural and with uh, urban uh, subjects and then also your own surveys. And I think that you know, your own uh, engagement in gathering data is really to be commended. But um, having said that, there are lots of uh, national and, and regional or localized time use surveys. And um, for your next presentation, I would love to see your own research um, compared alongside some of the national data, because clearly there is that kind of national data that, that's available to you, and you've probably already look through a lot of it. So um, in, your, in, your, in your own experience and in your own background research for this project, did you find any dramatic differences between um, the women and men that you interviewed here in Kentucky versus other national surveys of time use data in terms of uh, you know, how, they, how much time they spent watching children or cleaning the home or doing that? Thank you for your question. So I've actually not looked at, though I'm sure it is available, um, secondary data on time use studies because I think they're, they're easy to conduct. That was something that I really just kind of came up with as COVID happened <laughs> to try to be making a productive use of time because I've been so dedicated to being away and I've, I've just been home <laughs> since then. Um, so I, I can't be in people's homes asking questions or stories anymore. Um, that's something that I definitely wanna see. I know that my work um, agrees with a lot of what people are saying right now, I just don't see a whole lot of people writing on it. I saw people like Dr. Scott writing on it in the 90s and commenting on a wave then, but I think there's definitely a one coming now. Um, and I saw a New York Times article actually as I was first starting the work that said, like, now that coal is gone, women are going to the hospital um, and was doing essentially journalistic style interviewing of people. And I was like, this is timely, that's, that's great. Um, so I've definitely used secondary sources like census information um, to get at the employment part, to validate kind of like what I'm, what I'm doing, but I'd love to see what people do during their week too, and especially to, to clear up my own. I think they could be kind of biased. People might report things more in favor of themselves. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just uh, uh, first a question about about the uh, the sample and, and curious about how you identified the folks that you interviewed versus the ones that you surveyed and then as you make you know make comparisons across rural women men rural men urban women urban men are are the are there similar demographic characteristics across those, such as, let's say, the age distribution, for example. At, you know, because that could explain some of these differences. Right, right. Thank you for asking. And if I understand it correctly, you're saying that you, you think it, it would make sense that there's a difference maybe in an urban kind of sample size if, say, I'm getting more young people in an urban population, like answering my survey in general. Per perhaps, yeah. yeah. I, just, I just don't know if you examined that as part of this. Yeah, so I, th I think it's fair to note additionally that I've done everything voluntarily. Um, I've done this through advertising means. I, it definitely didn't have any kind of like financial benefit to people at the start, although I've compensated them all at the end. So a lot of people that are voluntarily responding to this at some level I think have to um, either empathize with me or my work or know me directly and I don't know who they are um, because everything was kept anonymous aside from people who decided to, to do interviews with me. Um, but I suspect that things are pulled downward in general because of that, and then additionally because of electronic means of advertising for the most part. So I think my average age of someone participating with me is like 43, 44, um, and I expect that there's not as many people my grandmother's age just because of the way in which that I'm conducting things. I wasn't able to go out and randomly kind of force people to participate. Um, and then in the urban numbers, 
Um, it actually was older, and I, I think it's because I know more people in a rural setting, so there were more people my age that were willing to respond that knew me as friends. Um, we're in an urban setting where I've not lived for very long. I think a lot of people that were responding were through listservs, through like my mentors, um, and so we're actually a little bit older. So I think they respond to more household work probably accurately than even the rural people do who may not have a, a family of their own yet if they decide to. And, and did your, your, uh, your, interview, your interview research, did that inform the structure of your survey or were the two done independently? Yeah, um, so they basically followed the same kind of breakdown and order each, um, but oral history interviews were kind of meant to provide the quotes that I've got and then to provide more nuance. So within surveys, if I have breakdown sections of um, demographics at the beginning, familial background, uh, employment history after that, and then the in-depth kind of like strongly agree to disagree of some gendered statements and then other things to kind of get a view on how people feel about who people are and what they should do. Um, oral history interviews kind of went the same way except gendered views were not asked in that same statement way and so it got vaguer at the end following people with kind of like the impact that it's had on them. The survey didn't have that aspect to it. So they do follow each other very closely and kind of like what the order is and what I'm getting at, but that one was meant to be getting more how people's lives are negatively impacted by these views. Um, and then hopefully I have powerful statements to bring to people and say, here are the numbers and here's how they feel. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Thank you. and I'm a senior here at UK, majoring in biology and minoring in pharmacology. I do reproductive endocrinology and toxicology research under Dr. Patrick Hannon in the OBGYN department at the College of Medicine, and our research focuses on environmental toxicants and their effects on female reproductive health. Emerging science suggests that unavoidable exposure to different chemicals may cause infertility. Some of these toxicants include a family of chemicals called phthalates. Phthalates are used as solvents and plasticizers in a multitude of common consumer products, including personal care items, cosmetics, food and beverage containers, car upholstery, and even in the building materials found in our homes, workspaces, and large cinemas like this. And because of their widespread use, avoiding exposure is nearly impossible. Humans are also exposed to multiple different types of phthalates on a daily basis, so this study utilizes an environmentally relevant phthalate mixture, which is a unique approach because the majority of other studies investigate only single phthalate exposures. And you can see the composition of this mixture in the gray table on the left of the slide. So why does this matter? This matters because previous research suggests that phthalates are able to directly target the ovary. And because phthalates have been known to disrupt endocrine and reproductive systems, exposure may be having negative effects on fertility and overall reproductive health. Studies also suggest that women who are actively seeking treatment at IVF clinics due to fertility issues experience a lower quality of life. And because ovulatory defects are the leading cause of infertility in women, meaning the egg is not properly released from the ovary, we investigate the effects that these chemicals have on the ovulatory process directly. So collectively, having a better understanding of how phthalates potentially hinder ovulation could be beneficial to the overall health care of women. So briefly, ovulation occurs when the egg is released from the pre-ovulatory follicle, which are the functional units of the ovary that um, house the egg. 
As you can see in the graphic in the bottom left corner, this process is initiated by the mid-cycle luteinizing hormone surge, which I will refer to as LH, or clinical treatment of human chorionic gonadotropin, which I will refer to as HCG, and it's essentially just a more potent analog of LH. This surge of LH or HCG also induces prostaglandin production. Prostaglandins are integral molecules that drive ovulation by causing inflammatory-like processes. These LH or HCG-induced increases in prostaglandins are required for successful ovulation, and inhibiting prostaglandin, prostaglandins results in failure of ovulation. Even taking a common NSAID like aspirin or ibuprofen, which inhibits prostaglandin production, at the appropriate timing can inhibit ovulation in women. So specifically, this study investigates the effects of this environmentally relevant phthalate mixture on prostaglandin production. So we essentially did this study by isolating individual ovarian follicles and putting them into culture with different treatment groups. Those treatment groups included DMSO alone, which is not an ovulatory stimulus, HCG alone, which is an ovulatory stimulus and is that more potent analog of LH that I previously mentioned, and HCG plus increasing doses of the phthalate mixture. We then visually assessed ovulation and measured prostaglandin levels. So in the top right corner, we have our ovulation assay, and it is our most striking data. The y-axis represents ovulation percentage, and the x-axis represents our different treatment groups. DMSO is always represented by a white bar. The HCG ovulatory control group is always represented by a black bar. And the colored bars represent HCG plus increasing doses of the phthalate mixture ranging from lowest to highest dose. As you can see, when the follicles were treated with no ovulatory stimulus, ovulation occurred at an expected 0%. When treated with the ovulatory stimulus alone, ovulation occurred at an anticipated 80%. But as we increase the dose of the phthalate mixture, we see a greater decline in ovulation rates, with the highest dose of the phthalate mixture being statistically equivalent to the group that did not receive the ovulatory stimulus and did not ovulate. So below the ovulation assay, we have graphs that represent the levels of two different prostaglandins, PGE2 and PGF2-alpha. The y-axis now represents percent change of prostaglandin levels relative to HCG alone, and the x-axis represents those same treatment groups. So here, when treated with the ovulatory stimulus alone, we see expected increases in prostaglandin levels. However, similar to the ovulation assay above, when we treat with a phthalate mixture, we see decreases in prostaglandin levels at essentially every dose of the mixture. So collectively, these data suggest that phthalate exposure may be contributing to ovulatory defects by decreasing prostaglandin levels. Again, this is concerning because ovulatory defects are the leading cause of infertility in women, and if we can better understand the mechanisms by which phthalates potentially hinder ovulation, we can provide better health care to women suffering from different reproductive disorders. I want to thank you all for listening, and I am happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent, uh, Katie. Um, I guess my, there are a lot of questions, and again, a lot of ignorance on my part, but um, the, the main question I've got is, give me a sense of scale. So you've got 10 micrograms, 100 micrograms, and 500 micrograms per milliliter. Um, but what does that look like? How, what does that relate to in terms of, um, you know, the hand lotion or whatever those things might be? How much uh, engagement does, does a woman need to have with, with these um, in, in the wild, so to speak, in order to see these sorts of effects? Right. So people have different exposure profiles based on numerous factors, including like lifestyle choices, different occupations, things like that. Um, so exposure to different of these individual phthalates ranges anywhere from 0 0.12 to 30 microgram per kilogram per mil. Um, in relation to our specific concentrations that we chose, um, this, we want to see a dose response curve here. So also, if you look at the concentration of the individual phthalates relative to its percentage of the mixture as a whole, the lowest um, dose of the phthalate mixture, which is one microgram per mil, is still below the highest level of that same phthalate found in follicular fluid from women. So this, in that this uh, mixture is environmentally relevant in that sense. Does that answer your question? Sure, you answered it in there, and I just lost it. Um, so <laughs> just just bear with me for a second. So you just said the one microgram is is that? Uh, I thought I heard you say that your average uh, average woman it would be zero point five or something to thirty micrograms. Is right, that, but that that's for the individual phthalates, and this is oh, like this for its percentage a as a mixture. Yes. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. I see. okay. 
So which, which of these um, is, is sort of where a, an average American woman would be expected to have exposure of this combined nature? Um, so because of the statistics that I just told you of like the average exposure, um, I would say the one in the 10 microgram. However, because people do have different exposure profiles, that can like vary. Right, of course, but okay. So, so we're looking at the pink bar as sort of where, yeah. uh, between yellow and pink is sort of where most folks are, but it's still having a significant impact mm -hmm. already exactly. at, tho at those yes. levels. Uh, and so what, I know this we're taking this beyond that, but I want to ask, um, conclusively demonstrating this, what would you see as the, as the next stage? Is it creating a list of things to avoid for, for a woman who wants to um, conceive, or, or what, would, what would your recommended practical real world steps be for this? That's a great question. So this study wasn't necessarily designed to make regulatory statements such as we should ban phthalates. However, certain countries, including like the US, um, Thailand, and countries in the EU, are starting to limit or ban um, certain concentrations of phthalates in specific items, namely like children's toys. Um, I just think it's very important for people to be aware of the chemicals that they're exposed to on a daily basis. I know personally, since it getting involved in this research, I definitely start to look at the chemicals that are in um, the products that I'm using, like hairsprays and lotions, shampoos, um, perfumes, things like that. Great. Thanks. Well done, Chris. Thank you. Yes, if I could follow up on this. Um, are, are, is phthalate exposure the kind of thing that can be found, say, in our, in our uh, water supply and, you know, in, 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 uh, uh, in yeah, water supply state say, to start with? Yes. Or is it only something that can be measured in, 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 in uh, human fluids or hu human uh, cells? or yeah. animal cells. So I actually have read some papers, phthalates are able to bind yeah. and be in water. Um, actually, the most common route of exposure to phthalates is oral um, ingestion mm -hmm. through like food and beverage containers, yeah. so. Yeah, so if it's, in your, if it's in your plastic Tupperware, then it can be in the food that you're exactly. eating out of the plastic exactly. Tupperware. And therefore, mm -hmm. will end up in your water supply as a, as a waste product, possibly. Looked at mice. Yes. Um, are, are there other animals that you'd, you would use to do this kind of experiment on? Um, in our lab specifically, we do ma uh, mouse work as well as human work. Um, due to my limitations of being in the lab as a student, I'm definitely more involved in the mouse study, but we are doing human work. And those are um, like follicular aspirates from human, from women. Uh, yeah, a cup, couple of questions. Uh, one, ma mainly related to your, your use of, of, of mouse. Mm -hmm. So and this kind of follows up on a previous question about these, these concentrations of 1, 10, 100, 500 micrograms. Is, uh, are those, those are relative to the mouse or relative to a, a human? So in other words, you know, a mouse is, obviously not a human, much smaller, mm -hmm. uh, are, are these concentrations expected uh, to affect humans or are they just demonstrated via the mouse? Right, so this mixture was actually derived from urinary phthalate levels found in pregnant women enrolled in a study by our colleagues at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So this I these concentrations are based off of human exposure um, however, we do know the mouse is a good model for this because if you look at our data, the HCG, which is the ovulatory stimulus, causes abundant increases in ovulation rates as well as prostaglandin levels. And so, uh, and, and that brings me to another question of, of curiosity. We're, we're, uh, these treatments are based on the human uh, gonadotropin, not the mouse. So you're telling me the human version of this substance affects ovulation in mice? Yes, so humans and mice actually have really similar reproductive um, systems. So while this mixture was derived from levels from humans, um, we know that, are you asking like, is it, are these exposures relevant? No, what I'm asking is are you using the human 
the human version of this hormone on the mouse or are using the mouse version of the hormone on the mouse. Oh, I'm sorry, I see. In addition so to the, the uh, chemicals. Right, so the HPG, okay. Right. That is a hormone that is, um, it acts on both the mouse and the human. It's the same hormone. Thank you. Sorry. Oh, great job, students. Um, at this time, um, I'm going to ask you all to exit the cinema and um, probably give us about 20 minutes or so. Um, good news is we had a lot of live people following um, on live Facebook Live and YouTube. They're the highest number I saw at one point was about 50 some. Is that about right? 55. Amazing. However, I didn't see any questions come through. Did you, Anna Claire? Yeah, so, but that means there was a lot of people watching the live. So. Right, guys, we'll reconvene here as soon as the uh, judges deliberate on the the results. This way.